Girl, stop playing. Girl, stop playing podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I believe you can make the money and you can get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. And today I get to introduce y'all to another working woman. But before we get into today's show, I got to make sure y'all remember that you got to like this episode comment below and let us know how much you enjoyed the conversation and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out on any of the amazing guests that are going to be gracing the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Pull Your Car, my brand new party game that is adding a little razzle dazzle to your next girl night, game night, vacation, vacation, family reunion, whatever you, however you like to get it in, Pull Your Card is the perfect addition to the party. You can grab your deck at PullYoCard.com. Today, you get to meet Mrs. Miss. She miss y'all. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Taya. Miss Taya (laughs) Rapley. You just tore me all up. They're going to edit this, y'all. Let me say that again. (laughs) Today, y'all get to meet my girl, Tanya Rapley. She is the founder of My Fab Finance, which provides content and a community around money for millennials and maternal, which is a resource that provides financial, educational, and emotional support during pregnancy. Welcome to the show, Tanya. It's about time that I'm here. Listen, I know. (laughs) We had to work it out, but we did it. You are in the building, and I've been looking forward to this conversation. I I have a feeling we're about to get into some stuff. We're going to get into it. Listen, we're going to get into it. We're going to keep it light, but we are going to get into it. Um, So I want to talk first about your evolution as a CEO, because you've done a lot of things since I've known you, you know, from my my fab finance to, you know, the, the multiple businesses that you have purchased the businesses that you have started and I want to just talk about how your passions have changed as you've pursued different entrepreneurial endeavors yeah like serial entrepreneur for real and I feel like most entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. at heart Mm -hmm. um because there were businesses before my fat finance that didn't work that we don't know about it was just like okay this isn't making sense Mm -hmm. this doesn't work um and what's funny is I feel like now it's coming full circle because I'm kind of returning to where I started so I went to school for public administration public okay. policy and in college what does that mean exactly so for me it meant less math <laughs> no gotcha. but for me <laughs> it also meant that like working with governments I worked on city plans so I went to college okay. in Miami so okay. I worked on city plans for quite a few of the municipalities in Miami Florida created community like focus groups and charrettes and everything like that a lot of research around affordable housing then this was right before the crisis of 2008 mm-hmm. and so it's funny because I'm kind of moving back into that now mm-hmm. after I've been in my fat finance but there's so many things I think most people know me from my fat finance but I also um I tried my hand at being a CFO for a little while that wasn't my thing, Not your thing. for, for a, a startup and we just really looked at our minimal viable product and was like this does not, not this ain't gonna catch like we hope it would mm-hmm. and so we decided to move away from that but then also um I started a company, Caninclusive, which is what we co-founded Caninclusive, which mm-hmm. is seeking to drive diversity and inclusion in the cannabis space. And that yes. is still operating. Okay. I stepped back because it was starting to mess with my finance clients. Like they were like, it's they still were schedule we- one. a little weary. Oh yeah. They're like, it's still schedule one. You can't be a spokesperson now here running yeah. around selling, selling cannabis. I can't believe this is still life. It's crazy. You know, it's great. But uh, hey, look, that's the benefit of having two co-founders. Because mm-hmm, I was mm-hmm. like, listen, we're not about to mess the money up. Right. This is still a startup. This is not bringing enough money to cover all of our bills. Uh, but the beautiful thing about that is they've really been holding down the fort, Mary um, and Charlize and the team behind them. And we're the only black women in New York City with our cultivation license. Well, nice. New York State. Got you. Can't occlusive. And so, like, that's the beauty of, like, What's starting What's a cultivation things. license? Cultivate. You can grow. You, you out here you growing. Legally, you can legally grow and sell. Wow. In okay. New York. Um, and so, we're, it's part of, like, a larger license. Uh-huh. But that's, it's, you know, that's the beauty of having multiple interests and kind of fielding them and starting things. Like, you know what? Mm-mm. Like, and you don't have to be the face of everything. No, is, I don't want to be the face right. of, like. That's hard. It is hard. I'm burnt. Listen. Like, I, I just posted, um. 
that on Instagram last night, um, someone else was saying, like, she's burnt out. I've been a full-time content creator for eight years. That is like... Well, d- January will make eight yeah. years, seven mm-hmm. years so far. Your girl is... Tad. I'm, you know, every time you turn around, the algorithm's changing and all these other things. I was like, you know what, Instagram? <sighs> Get out of here. I just literally, I just did Instagram Live, like, earlier today. I read an article yesterday. I think it was on Forbes. But... The whole article was about the fact that black women are leaving social media. Yeah. And it's like, we, That's t- we, I- are, ty- we are tired t- with a T. Tired. Yeah, it's you a know? lot. And when you look at like the gifts and everything, a lot of them are based around like black women, mm-hmm, black characters mm-hmm, and everything mm-hmm. else. I feel like we're low key getting M- moving the- this thing. It's we're us. moving it. Yes. We're definitely moving it. But we ain't it. monetizing it like we should. Yes. Like, you remember yeah. Clubhouse was around and like mm-hmm, that's what everybody mm-hmm, says. Like mm-hmm. all of us are driving Clubhouse's platform. We need our own platform. And people yes. try to put one together. Didn't work, but yeah. Clubhouse kind of yeah. just came and went. Fizzled. So. It's a little, a little fizzled out a little bit. Yeah. Um. So with, I do want to start with my fat finance. Yeah. Just a little bit. My baby. Because we are, I don't know if we in a recession, getting into one. I don't know what the current status is. Okay. Yeah. But that is a scare for a lot of people who don't have diverse income streams and who aren't necessarily in control and driving, you know, their own destiny. Which yeah. we're gonna talk about designing your destiny as well. Um, but what is your advice for like what people should be doing right now in preparation of or in survival of a recession? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think even if you have multiple revenue streams, it's still something like, ooh, ooh, what, what what's going on? To, like, what happens if a few of these dry up? Mm-hmm. Because we all become accustomed to a certain quality of life and a standard. So, I mean, even me, me when I was thinking about my pivot, I was like, okay, how is this going to affect the companies that I depend on and how should I move accordingly based on that? Mm-hmm. Are we in a recession? You know, they keep pushing back what recession means, what recession means, what recession But we know we have inflation. Some stuff is going like, on. What yeah. we do know is things are expensive. Yes. And the, like our quality of life is, you know, a lot of us have become accustomed to a certain quality of life and that quality of life is costing us more. So irregardless of if we enter a recession or not, you still need to be preparing for whatever. Mm-hmm. Like the best thing to do is prepare for the worst but the worst doesn't occur mm-hmm, and you're still mm-hmm. prepared. And you're still prepared. Yeah. Yes, because now you're like, ooh, now I get to breathe easier yeah, yeah. than if it actually would have occurred. And I think it's important to note that there are going to be people who go through personal recessions and there are going to be people who aren't impacted by this recession. And it all is dependent on planning. Like while you can get ahead of it, get ahead of it. They've been mm-hmm. talking about this thing since January mm-hmm. of 2022. If it happens in March of 2023, you can't say they you have not been talking it. about this. Yeah. I just feel like at this point, I can't really have an interview without somebody asking that That's question. Because people, what do we do, Taya? What do we do? How I know. We, we don't want to go into the Great Depression. Right. Like, we don't, Lord knows. Like, yeah. you know, we don't want things to get that hard. And I don't think they will because we're just a completely different society. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's like very digital, remote work as possible. Uh, I just think that it's very different now. Mm-hmm. But you can still experience a personal recession. Yes. So do you, in terms of like investments, and I know, you know, there's obviously not a one size fits all thing, but I know you're into real estate. We've talked, you know, offline about getting into trading and all of the things. What would be your best advice, even though we know everybody's situation is different, Mm -hmm. but what is something that you feel confident in that people could at least start exploring or looking into in terms of like investment opportunity? Investment opportunities? Um... That's interesting because, like you said, it's based on everybody else's. I think that when we think about investing, it's like making money, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I think investing in yourself, honestly, Ooh. and like, honestly, the truth is investing in yourself because investing in yourself will give you more capital to invest in other things without the fear and concern or the need for it to pay off. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a reason they have accredited investing as a standard for people to make larger investments because they're like, if you lose it all, we don't want you to blame like, us. Don't be looking over We here. don't want you to lose it if you yeah, lose it all. Right. Like, so we need to make sure you can afford to lose money. Mm-hmm. And I think the same thing is like investing in yourself, investing in your skill sets, investing in your knowledge, and be- whatever that looks like so that you can bring in more money Mm -hmm. that's the most important investment Mm -hmm. to be making right now facts and then utilizing that extra money to invest in other things invest in maybe you say okay let me buy land Mm -hmm. you know land like and understand what game you're playing because like buying land is not like a quick turnaround you're not gonna buy it today long term plan is there are certain instances where you can flip it, but for the most part, it's a long-term thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and even real estate, you know, I bought my first investment property in December, called myself taking December off to learn how to trade 
bought an investment property first week of December. Trading went out the window. Right, right, right. Um, just now getting that apartment, oh, those apartments rented out, um, decided to go the short-term rental route with them. But it's like that's a, it's not necessarily a quick turnaround. The quickest turnaround is going to be you. Right. Like, that's the quickest turnaround. Yep. And then use that money to... To do other things. Yeah. To, di- to diversify. Um, so you talk a lot about designing your life. And you have been very unapologetic in doing things your way. Pivoting as necessary. <laughs> like, I'm going to live the life that, that makes me happy. The life that is fulfilling for me. So what is your definition of designing your life? How does how does that truly look? Um, the design of my life looks like living in the way I was designed and, and aligned with my divine assignment. So that's what designing my life means is like understanding who I was designed to be mm-hmm. and being true to that. And then also honoring the divine assignment, what I feel like I was put here to do. I feel like I was put here to be a teacher, like and not a school teacher. Cause they ain't make enough money for me. Listen. <laughs> I did work in nonprofit, but I'm I'm so happy I had a friend that freed me. She said, Tanya, you can do well and get paid well for yes. doing it. Yes. Like I, I saw someone had a a clip recently about like service and service and important to serve. And it's like, yes, but you don't gotta struggle through your right. service. Right. Like you can serve and get paid well. Mm-hmm. And so I think that my I think I was put here to live a good life yes. <laughs> and help others do the same and inspire others to do the same. But also honoring who I am and knowing who I am like life design also means that the way you live your life now might not make sense five years, 10 years down the line because you're a different person. Hell, three years down the line because mm-hmm. you're a different person. You've gone to different things like last year I was married. This year I'm divorced. My life Girl, design looks completely. Girl, stop answering questions before I ask them. Oh my them. bad, my bad, my bad, my bad. Spoiler alert. Don't get to that. Um, but yeah, like life design is it's also flexible. And one of the things I have written down in my little shower pad because I have like I get all my good ideas in the shower. Come on, shower so pad. So I have like this little pad you can write notes on in the shower. And it's like life design doesn't mean having the perfect life. It doesn't. It means having a life where you can flow through the challenges that may arise and enjoy as many portions of this life as possible. Mm -hmm. It's not always going to be perfect. So you mentioned the life that I was designed for. Like, how do you come to that realization of what you were designed for? Like what you what you specifically were designed to do? Yeah. As you said, I'll be doing what I want. Right. Um, And so it is a lot of trial and error. It's relocation. I mean, when I graduated from college, there was a point where I lived in like five cities in two years mm. just like picking up a I hate like, moving oh, oh my god I mean I had nothing then so it was like well, we easy. taking a bag we, we yeah, packing yeah, a suitcase yeah. up like yeah. I was so disrespectful like we're gonna leave that furniture my mom and dad you know? in here yeah like, Y'all now that out. I know how much furniture costs girl uh, it's a thing. Um, but it was like relocating, changing my environment to see like what spoke to me most. I feel like I found myself the most in New York City because New York really provides space for you to explore all your layers without judgment. Mm-hmm. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. There's certain things that I did in New York City that you North could never Carolina, do in North they'd Carolina. be like, oh, girl, she is, is she like one of them Neptunes girls? Like, it's like <laughs> it was just alternative. It was weird yeah. with Charlotte. Um, I would say also exploration. And so I was raised Christian. I studied Buddhism. I converted to Islam in my mid 20s. Really? Then, yep. Did you unconvert? I mean, I whatever. Okay. I, I, don't I don't know, know what that what, I don't what know if called, you denounce but, okay. or whatever. I stopped praying five times a day. Gotcha. I was like, y'all, what I'm not coming to this like, shit no for more. The cause. Huh? What was that pivot like? Like when you did you have like a realization and it's like, no, this is not for me anymore? I did. Huh, I did. Interesting. Um, it was me asking questions, and I was asking questions and stuff just wasn't making sense. Math for me. wasn't math. Then. It was, and I was like, mm, yeah. I don't. Now this might work for some people, yeah. and that's where I've come to the realization is that I feel like God finds people the best way that He can enter their lives. Mm-hmm. And though, so for some people, Islam makes sense. For some people, Judaism makes sense. For mm-hmm. some people, Christianity makes sense. So for some people, ag- ag- being agnostics makes sense. And so for me, it's like, okay, well, that's cool for y'all. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Like, I've seen what this is about. Me and God, like, thank you. I talked to God five times a day for the past year and a half. We are, we good. Me and God like this. And um, I feel like I learned a lot about myself in that process and learned a lot about myself from walking away from that process. Because I think that there's a lot of fear um, involved with shifting your religion or going against what's been instilled in you. And I really had to trust my intuition, trust God and trust myself. Mm -hmm. And so I think I learned a lot about myself in that process. Um, And just being curious, just being curious, therapy, 
Mm-hmm. Like, um, Come on, therapy. Therapy, I remember um, when I had my son, I had a lot of anxiety. That I was like, girl, you're not even an anxious person. We don't even, listen, we talk about postpartum depression, but we don't anxiety. ever mention postpartum anxiety. Girl, that everything got a, a label on it. A, a, a choke hazard, a, mm-hmm. you know, a SIDS warning. And it's like, like, this is your responsibility. If something happens, it is on you. you. Like, yes. this is your person. Yes. And yes. you love them. Yes. Like, you know, my son, I was like, I, my, I remember my mom telling me that when she had me, she's like, I never felt love like that. And like, it's true. Becoming mm-hmm, a parent, mm-hmm. you're just like, oh my gosh. This I is didn't mine. know. Yeah. Wow. Like, I love you beyond. Yeah. And so I had all these roles that I was playing. I was CEO. I was mom. I was wife. And my therapist was like, you've never renegotiated your relationships in these re- in these role changes. Mm-hmm. And you haven't given yourself time to deal with these different roles. You're just rolling with the punches mm-hmm. instead of being like, okay, who am I in this Pause. space? Pause, yeah. Yeah, so therapy was really helpful in that regard, too. Listen, okay, so let's talk about maternal. Because yeah. I, becoming a mother, you know, you... I feel like people be judging me when I say this, but I can only be honest, okay? What I thought, like my first introduction to postpartum depression was like an episode of ER. It was like a woman had come in, she had tried to harm her baby, and in my mind, that's what postpartum depression that's meant. Baby. Right, it's like, yeah. you don't like your baby, you don't love your baby, It's that's what it meant Let to me. Let me cry in the room. And listen, don't cancel me, don't kill me in the comments. That's truly what I thought it meant. Yeah. But then you become a mother, and I'm a part of all of these Facebook groups, because I don't know what the hell I'm doing, I'm just trying to figure it out, so I'm getting a part of these communities to try to get with other people. And the things that they were going through and talking about, I could not necessarily identify with, mm-hmm. But then I had my baby and I still don't necessarily feel like I, you know, I never wanted to harm my child. I never wanted to harm myself, but I feel like there was definitely like a, a loss of like my old life, you know, like a depression around losing who I was and the freedom. I mean, especially as entrepreneurs, The the freedom that we are blessed with is like irreplaceable. So losing that. And then it's like, yo, this baby is, He's still here. You know, like you wake up and he's still here. Or they wake so, you up. It's yeah, like, it's like, damn, I'm a mom again. You know, like again. I can't even sleep how I want I, to. I still, still can't sleep how I want to, okay? <laughs> <laughs> still can't sleep how I want to. But that to me is a conversation that we don't have. You don't know these things until you're in it. You can't really prepare for it. And like I just said, the anxiety thing, you know, like making sure he's still breathing. That's a whole thing that it's like, Never goes away. I don't think it's right. Still still do. I I don't think it's. I don't think it's ever going to go away. And so I'm assuming that part of that was like some of your motivation behind creating, you know, the movement. But tell me, like, what was your what was your motivation behind it? Maternal was a lot about my life design. Mm -hmm. Um, And even then, I was designing my life, and I didn't really know that I was doing it back then. But I worked in nonprofit before becoming a full time entrepreneur in the Mm -hmm. finance space. And so we talked a lot about maternal mortality. Like this was before it was a buzzword. This is like 2010, 2011. Mm-hmm. We're talking about maternal mortality. So I was terrified. Yes. I was like, yo, women are really dying. Really dying Having babies out here. In, like in America. Two, post 2000s. And Georgia is like number one on the list. Yeah. And so I had, I mean, I had anxiety about that. And so when I got pregnant, I had an, um, I had an OBGYN. I had a midwife. And I also had a birthing class instructor. Mm-hmm. So I took Bradley birthing method, the Bradley birthing method. And then I had my my midwife who I was paying for out of pocket and then mm-hmm. OBGYN who the my insurance was paying. Yeah. And I realized, and I had an amazing like pregnancy. I had an amazing delivery. It was just beautiful. And I realized that I had a privileged birthing experience because I had the financial resources mm-hmm. to do so. Yep. And I didn't want women not to have a beautiful and therapeutic birthing experience because they of couldn't money. afford it. Yeah. Right. So that's why maternal was created. Gotcha. But then also we support pregnancy and beyond. So it's not just like pregnancy. Baby, it's, it's a beyond. It's, po- it, it's really the postpartum. Yes. Like it really is the like, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to wash my hair and eat in between trying to get Can sleep? I shower? Because they tell you sleep while the baby sleeps, but it's like, yeah, what right. do I I'm worried do? about the baby staying alive while he's sleeping. I need to watch him. And like, what do I, because I, now I got to catch up. Yeah. Like now I got to yeah. like wash my ass while yeah. the baby is yeah. sleeping. And then because he might wake up in the middle of, so it's a thing. It, yeah. it, so I want women to have that support because I think a lot of that also drives postpartum depression. For and sure. Like I, I remember, and I had all these resources. My midwife was amazing. After I had my son, you had a hospital birth, but she came to the house like every day. 
to check on me and like made sure I ate and everything mm -hmm. else. And my um like Karis' father was also amazing. I was like, look, we gotta eat. And so he got he worked, found a chef and was having meal prep mm -hmm. like meals delivered. We ate so good in them postpartum days, but that really helped. I still remember sitting down in my room, like trying to find something to wear. And I was like, damn, I can't wear none of this. Mm -hmm. My titties is leaking. Mm -hmm. I can't wear this. I can't wear this. I gotta be able to like easy access and like breastfeed him and everything. And it hit and I was like, Wow, life is different. <laughs> like, girl, you can't even leave the house without putting your little nipple pad in. Yep. Because yep. otherwise you're you gonna, gonna have the little, By the you're gonna have a little ring yep. like right there on your shirt. You'll be embarrassed. Because the letdown that happened. Yep. And um it was that and then I wanted to get my nails done. I was like, I don't even have time to go get a manicure and a pedicure. And I mean that could sound privileged or whatever, no, but like that's, sound, that's me real time. life. Yeah. And it was like And I'm not I, taking my baby to the nail shop. That's no, one place he is not I'm going. I'm not taking a newborn. Like yes. here's I mean, I ain't I'm not judging anybody that has. Yeah, no shade. No, I'm just not, you gotta I, do what you gotta do. But Kara still ain't step foot in the nail yeah, shop. Yeah, no. Like we gonna do it while we're he's at school. It, right. But also, I'm an entrepreneur. That comes down to life design, right? And understanding that like, I have the freedom want to, to make those have choices. Space for myself. Yeah. Outside of being a parent, and for me, being an entrepreneur allows me to have that space mm -hmm, for myself, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. allows me to afford to hire people to give me that space for yep. myself. So yeah, that's maternal. We, I mean, we provide. We also cover. Um, if someone wants to become a doula or a birth worker, mm -hmm. we will cover their training so that mm -hmm. they can become, so they can serve more black women. Yeah. Um, we we paid for laundry from when we played for housekeepers. I love um, it. Babysitters, diapers. Like, what do you need to experience motherhood on your own terms right now? There's so many things again that you like don't know about until it's like you're okay at this point you're pregnant there's no turning back like the baby is coming, <laughs> coming. you have to figure these things out it's too late for you to say okay wait a minute I'm not ready for that like you have to just it's like on the job training you got to figure oh it out God. and to your point I feel like I had a very privileged pregnancy um my birth experience was not I've never even talked about it y'all and I still I still got PTSD I still can't really talk about it I ain't gonna lie to you but what I had prepared because I'm I'm preparing for everything. Yes, I'm you're a prepper. Classes. Listen, I'm doing all of the things. Like I, you had your overnight. I, you had your night nurse. Listen, like, well, I was like, when I the had, baby coming? When I had my night nurse. I had the. Listen, I had all of it. I paid for the doula. I paid out of pocket. My husband works for Kaiser. Like we, when I say my baby would have cost like five hundred bucks, like nothing. Mm -hmm. We paid out of pocket for a home birth. You know, for a midwife, for the doula, for the all of the things, and then nothing that I prepared for worked out the way that I anticipated. Mm -hmm. But thank God I had, you know, the luxury of being able to, you know, try to plan my process the best that I could. But there are so many women who can't advocate for themselves. No. They show up at the hospital clueless, get taken advantage of, get mistreated, yep. get uh, borderline abused, you know, in these and hospitals. And, and they're scared. And it's a scary thing. Like, oh, there's so many reasons to actually be scared. And so, you know, I commend you for it because it ain't. I don't know there's not a lot of money in, you know, creating resources for... Oh, it's a labor of love. Right. It's Ain't no money over there. Right. This is a passion project. <laughs> Ain't no money over because there. Because <laughs> you realize, like, it's needed. It's necessary. And, you know, I just had my midwife um, on an episode where we talked about, like, how home birth home birthing is like shunned it's like looked down oh upon. my it's gosh the whole thing oh, yeah. i remember when i told my mom that i had hired a midwife my mom was like so you gonna have my great baby grandbaby in the house like some i was like like Girl, a heathen like some savage first it's of like, all like he might be safer in the house than the Very hospital and so. i might be safer there too yeah i was like but you know i'm gonna do my research but it is shunned That's now granted thing. i am not a home birther I, like, I, I was not either. I not get, my choice. But people I was think not. because like I eat, I eat gluten free and everything else that I'm like the home birth. No, keep that in the hospital. Like keep that trauma. I don't care how good your birthing experience is. There's some trauma associated with there them. Is, when them yeah. contractions come through and you just remember like your body's just getting assaulted. And you just like yeah, when is yeah, it over? Yeah. Like I didn't want that in my house. Yeah. I don't want to clean. I don't no, you know. It's messy. Birth I is believe. Messy wholeheartedly you know that God has a plan and you know my son had to go to the NICU for two days and so hindsight you know being 2020 all I can think about is what if something went wrong at my house you know like what if he needed extra care and I'm and I'm at the house because I'm so stubborn because I just you know have to do things yeah. my way so it really came down to me 
being a mother and thinking about my child and knowing that it doesn't matter what you want, you have to do what's best. And so that's even a tough thing that if you don't have a community, if you don't have support, if people are judging you and your choices, yeah. that's tough because you really truly are just trying to do, trying to do your best. best. You're trying to survive. You're tr- really, like you're just trying to survive yeah. because if you look at statistics, like that shit is scary. It is definitely scary if you start looking into black women specifically and our birthing experience. And that's why I say like when I was pregnant though, I was like, don't talk to me about your traumatic birthing Please, experience. Please, like, keep that to yourself. Okay, girl, oop, I don't want to hear that. Like, like girl, you're going to die twice. Um, Okay, so we not that's fielding, not helpful. we're not fielding those stories right now. I only want to hear about good, happy. positive tell me outcomes. The happy stuff. Like, tell me how the baby just slid out. Yes. Like, you didn't even know was you was so in labor. Yeah, girl, like, I didn't it was even so know bad. I was in like, Girl, yes. I didn't know I was pregnant yes. and I just had yes. a baby. I just showed up at a hospital <laughs> and the baby was there. <laughs> like, I, so, first of all, I'm so jealous of those know. women who are like, yeah, I had the baby on the way to the hospital. He just came so fat. Please. Me too, Corio. Listen, listen, please. I'm still very girl, prayerful. Maybe the second one. Maybe the hopeful, second one. You know, God. I was so I was like, at, God, I thought I was your girl. At labor, at like, at our like 20, listen, I was like, oh. Listen. We, listen, this ain't there. Late. Okay. I right. had like a 46 hour tra- traumatizing oh me and my husband. I'm like, when I tell you, me and my husband, we like thick as thick. Like it, it, he has seen me. You know, like if someone who experiences birth with you, mm. it's like it ain't. You could literally, I could do anything in front of you. Like I can listen. I, I have no shame, and there that's how I feel no in general now. Like shame. after you've been in the room with your like yes, everything you, in the air open, ev- everything. Be like girl, whatever. It ain't even who cares. You gonna see what you gonna see. You gonna see what you gonna see. Um, <laughs> okay, so we weren't even supposed to get into that conversation because I, I do got a couple more business com- uh, questions. So I, I'm just gonna ask you. That's this how motherhood more. takes that's over your life. Goes. You that's... know, these babies run everything. Um, but you posted something, and I want to go back to this because I felt like it was like such a profound thing. I think it was part of your birthday lessons like the the Mm -hmm. things that you've learned that was so good one of them was every good idea isn't yours to execute and Mm. I felt like is she talking to me because the moment I get a good (laughs) idea I'll be like oh I need to do it and I need to do it today yeah like right now how did you did you learn that lesson the hard way like how did you come to that conclusion and like help because that's I mean, such a thing. Yeah, I learned it from a few ways. I learned it from burning myself out because mm-hmm. I just had this tendency, right? You free up, you get overwhelmed, mm-hmm. you take things off your plate to free up yourself. And then you add only to Only to be things. like, you know what? I got capacity to do this thing. Let me, this, I had this idea and it's brilliant. Like, let, we got the space to do it. Like, mm-hmm. let's do it. I am continuously editing like myself. Remember, last two weeks ago, I created a journal. And it's like, and I was like, girl, who doing this lunch? And who doing this rollout? You know? Every idea is not like your idea to execute. And it could be an amazing idea. And I have to tell that to some of my friends who like, I came up with this like five years ago. And now look, somebody's executing. That might be their idea to execute. You're doing great at mm-hmm, what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Clearly, like that wasn't the thing that was going to be your next thing. That mm-hmm. wasn't going to be your amazing thing. And it's just like you can have great ideas. Like, yes. But you have to ask yourself, do I have capacity? Does my team have the bandwidth? Do I even want to sustain this? What is what is this doing for me that I need done in my life? Like mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. what really is it? What is this doing? And now, now I check on myself like, is this ego? Is this like mm. an ego play? Do I think I just got to do it all? Do we got to do it for like a claim? Like what yeah. we what we doing this yeah. for? Like does it add to the quality of your life? Does it add to the mission? Or is this an ego play? Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's important to ask ourselves that I bought a company 2018. Mm-hmm. I bought an e-commerce company because like, yeah, you know, I want to scale so and so and so. That e-commerce company like. It was, I'm going to take you out. It's a thing. It's in, I didn't like the inventory management and the customer service. Was it dropship? No. We held inventory and we were the one we distributed. Oh shit! And so it was just like I just knew you was drop shipping. No, no, okay. and I was like, and I it got to a point where I didn't want to check that inbox. I know because I feel it was you. like, what do you want me to do with the USPS didn't deliver? I gave it to them, girl. What, what I, did you want I had to, to fire myself from customer service because it's like I was borderline <laughs> cursing people out without using curse words. Like, call it, call it. That is office. stressful. But it it just goes back to say like me a lim- like that did not change the trajectory of my life that company right that company i closed it like nothing literally it's like a 
experience had. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but it, you it, learned some lessons and then. It wasn't necessary. Mm-hmm. It wasn't necessary. Um, and so I think that it's important to understand, like, when you get ideas, go back to what your core values are and go back to what your personal mission statement is. And does this thing align with those or is it an ego play? Is it a money is it a money grab? Or is it something that, you know, like, it's a great idea, but it just ain't mine. Yeah, yeah. And that's okay. Give yeah. it to somebody else. Like, girl, I was thinking about doing this, but I don't have the capacity. You, you got more wanna, time on your hands. Yeah. I know you're trying to leave your job. This might be a good hair. I did the research. Everything was ready to roll it out. Just take it in. Here go. you go. Don't even give me a percentage. Like, that's a blessing to you. you no, know? I want my percentage. Um, <laughs> but you know what? I feel like part of my... This is going to sound really bad, but I feel like part of my challenges have been having money to do things. I feel like when I didn't have no money, I was very, I was much more like strategic and I took my time because I had no choice. I yes. had no money. <laughs> but when you just got money to do stuff, you can make bad decisions yes. because you have money. Or access to credit. Yes. And, and it's that's like you don't need to thing. do that. Like that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I know how to build business credit, but I'm not like I'm very mindful of who I teach how to build business credit because if you don't know how to edit your ideas, will you teach me? What how to build business credit? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's it's it's. Yeah. I like to ask people stuff on camera. It so is. I'm easy. like, girl, let me play this it, back. You it, said no. Gonna it help is. Me. It's it, you know. I mean, I build business credit for you know. It's not one, hard. Two, three, it's just the three the, businesses. The the process you got to do this account you got to three of these accounts you got to wait six months i just yeah need... but there, there's a there's a way like a I, there's a shortcut okay there, we'll talk you, can, you can sign up for wink wink um yeah we'll, we'll get you situated okay. you don't have business credit i got a little bit i'm like Corey, i don't I know what your bit. idea is girl i got a little bit i'm not gonna go crazy okay. you can trust me because that's the thing is like people are getting like these large lines of business credit I've to fund these that. ideas they're not ready no. to follow through on but that bill is still due yes like you Facts. still have to pay Facts. that i yes. mean i know some people say like just go bankrupt and close Close it. Hell no. Uh, you don't have to worry about me doing that. I won't do you that. You know, so that's another thing. It's just like when you have the money, you listen, blow it. Listen, bought a whole business because yeah. the money was there. Yeah, yeah. Developed a product line for the business, everything. Developed a body care line, and now it's going to my Airbnb. Like, right, well, you, you pivoted. You can still. I pivoted. We were filling up the body it. wash container. I was like, we're going to take this body wash it. and they're going to use Club Blue for body wash in this Airbnb and they can buy it if they want to. Yes. Off my personal so store. So you're going to make it. Make it make it make sense. Yeah. So how do you know when it's time to pivot? Because I think that is such a tough position for a lot of people to be, especially when you're passionate about something. We can be passionate about some stuff that is like totally not for us, totally yeah. not profitable, totally stressing us out. And we don't want to let it go because mm-hmm. we've built this thing We've or we're known for, so for this long. thing or people expect this thing from us. Mm-hmm. When do you know that it's time to pivot? For me, it's a personal feeling. It's like, oof, like, I love it, but I'm exhausted by it. I'm not enjoying this the way I once did. And it's a systems are set up for me to pivot. So mm. let me be honest. Like, I didn't step away from my fat finance until I can afford a social media manager, until I had an assistant, until I had Who's a customer service person. Who's doing an amazing person. job, by the way, because that thing is still Like, still going. going. strong. Yes. It really is. So I didn't pivot until, like, and, and I knew I didn't want to abandon it. So I didn't pivot until there were people there to operate it, and we had solid systems in place, and, like, everybody was is a smooth running machine where I didn't even have to check in. Because mm-hmm. now it's to the point where I I barely have to check in. I'll be in my, I'll be like, oh, we, we sent a newsletter out this morning. Oh, good job. Isn't talk, that Candace. a great feeling? Like, like, like somebody's Candace, doing some this, shit without you know, me. Like I'll yeah. see a post, I'll be like, Kristen, that post you did today? Like, girl, I, I, I'm i detached from the day-to-day functions of the business. Mm-hmm. My job now is to go out and get money. Like, go out and get money. Um, So I knew that that's when I was ready to pivot, when I was feeling like I needed to pivot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm in, I started my fat finance in 2013. Almost 10 years. Almost 10 years. It's only so many budgets I'm willing to talk about. Like there are other people and they are career financial educators. That is not in alignment with my core values. Mm-hmm. I like variety. I like doing different things. I like learning different things. And so I realized, OK, now it's time to move to the next thing. You've proven to yourself that you can build something and stick with it. Let's go build the next thing. And it's done. Like it's repaid you. It's, oh. it's done. So I it mean, changed my life. You do TV yeah. frequently because I be trying to be the Latoya. She be like, no, I'm taping TV shows. <laughs> and then be all the time. always taping TV shows, doing the things. So, so that just goes to show like 
the investment. You're getting a return on your investment. It changed my life. Mm-hmm. It did. And I, you know, one of the things that also let me know there's time to pivot. I didn't care to do things that kept us relevant mm-hmm. or that will keep us relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, y'all can do that. But Tanya is not making three videos for TikTok. Yes. I'm not. Yes. Like these Instagram reels. Matter of fact, y'all going to get less reels for me because I'm tired of Instagram. So I also had to realize if I'm not willing to do what's necessary to remain competitive in that space, this it's might be a signal time. to you that yeah. it's time for you to do something that you're excited about being competitive. Yeah, in. yeah, yeah. And so, th- yeah, and then God, like really honestly asking God and like talking, like following your intuition. When you feel a way, like, let me sit down and get still mm-hmm. and listen to what, and, and talk to your trusted advisors. I was at ClickFunnels and I remember I was kind of like, was, oh, first of all, that was amazing. Was that your first time? No, that was my second time. It was a great was conference. amazing. It was. He knows how to do a conference. He does. I'm going back next year. I, like, me too. I don't buy, even know if I'm in digital marketing. My, I already paid my money. It's, it's, it was a great conference. It but was. I remember last year I went, I was on a mission, right? So I was on my mission to have my first million dollar year, like mm, in a single year. Did that. So like, did it. And did. And did. <laughs> so I was on a mission. So like, I went there in a very different space than coming back and being like, I feel like I'm in a transition. And... I, I feel weird. I feel out of place because I'm not here and I'm not mission oriented here. I'm just flowing. Mm. And that felt very weird for me because I'm so used to being focused on one thing to the point where I was like, I was in the room. I was like, girl, are you depressed? Like, <laughs> not a, what is happening right now? Go down and talk to people. And I'm glad that I did because a lot of my colleagues were there and I pulled up like one of my friends. There. We sat in the room. Mm-hmm. We like, I, like we laid out a whole new plan mm-hmm. and I trust him. And, that's the other thing about pivoting is like having people around that you can talk to be like you know I think I've done what I want to do in this and I want to do something else like I don't need your permission but I trust you what are your mm-hmm, thoughts mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and when they be like girl you you don't you don't roll this out yes you don't roll it out like nobody gonna say you gave up too early yes you've done it you have done it you've done I, the thing literally I ain't gonna toot my own horn, but toot it, girl. Your girl done did stuff. You've done like in sh- personal finance, yes. I really I've done more than I thought that I would in that space. Mm-hmm. Like self published my own Amazon bestseller. Like been in every major publication, like Forbes, Vogue, Essence, Ebony, like Women's Day. To the point where people call me now, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. People call me, I'll be like, mm, no, I don't, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't no, yeah. I, don't, I don't have time. You have the power to and say it, no. And it's, it's been beautiful. And my fat finance really changed my life and showed me my power. And sometimes you need things to show you how powerful you are. Girl, throw me this alley oop because my next question is around the Save Yourself book, right? So Tanya and I, <laughs> Tanya and I, speaking of showing you your power, Tanya and I collaborated um, on a book. It's called Nobody's Coming to Save You. So, okay, it's a guide for you to save yourself. And when I tell you. I had like a vision for what I wanted the book to do. But as I'm reading through the chapters, I'm like, this book is actually going to save someone. Oh. It's actually going to give someone the power and the courage and the confidence to, to identify. There's so many different stories from domestic abuse to like the corporate woman that had it all, thought she had it all and was like, no, this still ain't it, to homeless, like so many powerful stories of how women like pick themselves up mm-hmm. and decided that, you know, they're not waiting on somebody to come save them. So what would you say is your biggest hope that people will get from your chapter specifically? Mm. I would say that it's okay to reinvent yourself if that means saving yourself. Mm. Like if if you have to step away from everything that you've known or everything that everybody knows you for in order to save yourself and maintain your sanity, it's okay to do that. They'll understand later. Yes, they'll like, see it. They don't, they don't, they don't got to know and understand why you're doing it. And I know I did say, like, you know, asking my trusted people about transitioning and the pivot and everything. But there's a difference between pivoting and saving yourself. And you got to you gotta do what, like, you got to do what you're being told in that moment. Yes. And, that, yeah, that book, I was reading through the chapter. You know how you, like, you write something and you step away and, like, you were moved and move mm-hmm. on to other things. I was reading, I was like, dang, dang that, that's good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I was yeah. like, oh. Yeah, it is. I mean, it really is. And I'm not just saying it. Like, I'm going to put the link in the show description. I'm a YouTuber now, so I got to get used to saying it. I put the link in the show description <laughs> below. But get a copy because it's the bomb.com. Um, okay. So we got to talk about dating after divorce. Yeah. Cause Taya out here in these streets, y'all. <laughs> Taya is out here in these streets doing the damn thing. But I want to talk about it not just because I want to get all up in your business, even though we do like to get all up in people's business over here. Oh, girl, stop playing. But I think that the way that you are unapologetic about 
you're not stepping into dating in a depressive state. Mm-hmm. You're not stepping into not even dating, but stepping into this new season in um you're confident. You yeah. are looking forward to it. You're excited about it. So what has your experience been and what advice can you offer to someone who's not necessarily getting, you know, out of a divorce or leaving a relationship, but just advice for a single woman who's might be looking for something? Like what what is your experience and what lesson can you share? I do think that my experience is different than a single woman. Okay. Because like for me, especially returning to the dating scene, like I've been married, I had a baby, like Y'all, I'm not dating for marriage at this point. Mm-hmm. Like, I, that is different. You're right. There, there is a certain level of, um, or a certain lack of commitment that I'm in, like, in this And a like, confidence that you have when you're not looking for someone like, to complete you. Right. I don't, I don't want to have another baby. Yeah. Like, like, I, are you opposed to having another baby? I just don't see how it would happen. I'm okay. not opposed to okay. it, but I also feel like I was with Karis's father for 12 years total. And, <laughs> like we ain't work out and I'm like I don't have 12 years to get gotcha, to know gotcha, somebody gotcha. else okay. Man, I don't honestly have like two or three years to get to know somebody else I just don't see it happening the way I look at it is like you know I, his father will have a child to give care as a sibling or like I Good would luck, date somebody brother. Okay, gotcha. like so but I will say like for me I know I, I did I worked really hard in my marriage I know that I was a great wife I know what I brought to the table even now my ex-husband will text me and be like man it's been so hard, like, doing life without you. Like, I really took it for granted. Like, bro, I know. I told you that. Good luck, I sir. told you before. Yeah. I, I told you that life is going to be different without me. Um, and for me, it's just, like, that confidence in knowing what kind of woman I am. Um, but also the freedom to not be obligated to somebody and, like, to move in a space where it's like, no, I don't got to check in if I don't want to. Like, if I want to go straight to sleep, I can go straight to sleep. Uh, I mean, now I am dating someone. I am dating oh, someone. someone. Okay, I'm sorry. She is not in these streets. I I'm apologize. not not anymore. I apologize. Not anymore. Okay. I told. I remember talking with my homeboys, and I was like, "Dang, somebody don't found me." He was like, oh, "What? Like you don't stay in the market for long? They gonna snatch they you should, up? Yeah. Like they don't and, stay long. and I'm I'm dating somebody who I really enjoy. Like I really enjoy uh, when I first met him. I was like, I feel like we're gonna have fun together because I do think that when you get into those final stages of your marriage, like before it's ending, very rarely. And when it comes to divorce, are people like, man, we were having the time of our lives right, for our right, divorce. Right. Like, no, you don't really like each other like that. Like, things are tense. You're like, do I want to invite them? Do I want to spend like a mm-hmm, around mm-hmm. them like that when you get to a divorce point? And I miss enjoying being around somebody. Yeah. Like, I miss enjoying being around male energy and just like, this is just fun and refreshing. Mm-hmm. So that's what I was really looking forward to when I got it, when we was like, okay, we're not going to do this. Um, but there was still a grieving process. There was still, a, and even even now, I think that now we're selling our marital home. There's grief associated with that. Like that was the first home that I purchased. We purchased it together. Like we moved to Georgia in that house. Like that, I was sitting in the backyard literally yesterday because now the home is under contract and they had their congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And it was bittersweet. Mm-hmm. It was like this is another chapter closing. And like, I was that kid who cried watching Five Will Goes West. So for me, it's like, I'm emotional about this chapter closing. And it brought up, even though I went through therapy and worked through my grief and like the first, the first months after the divorce, like I would take care of my parents' house and like, they would just be, he would be with his grandparents for like a week at a time. So like mommy, if she needed to wake up and cry to get it out and like shower and like sit there on the edge of the bed and cry, I had the space to do that. And so I thought I got it all out. But things bring it back up. Like, oh, we're closing this chapter. Mm-hmm. Or like, like it even, really is over. Even yeah. orientation. I remember taking my son to orientation for school and like seeing all these families and everything. And I was like, dang, like I'm a single mom up in this joint. And like, you know, they're like, is his dad coming? I don't know where the bro. I don't know where bro. At. <laughs> <laughs> like he said he was on his way. We all live together. I don't know. And so it is like there's moments that bring things up where I do have like, oh man. Grief is pu- is pulling up, but my joy outweighs that. Mm-hmm. And like I work through it, move through it. What are we feeling right now, Tanya? Okay, that's understandable. Mm-hmm. Like, girl, you're that's that's really under that's understandable. And like name how you feel. Okay, you feel like this. You feel like this. You feel like this. You feel like you like. Because I remember when I, we first got divorced, I felt like I felt um, like a failure. Mm. I was like, my marriage failed. Like I'm telling people to own their power, da da da. And then I looked at it, I was like, no, Tanya, you owned your power because you chose to walk away from that marriage, mm-hmm. and you decided like it didn't serve you anymore, and it wasn't honoring you. Mm-hmm. So it didn't fail. You wanted honoring yourself, mm-hmm. and I just had to really, just really sit through and walk through it. Did you ever feel like 
I don't know if shame is the right word. Absolutely. But, oh, okay. That was yeah. the right word. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And my mom and dad are still married. My parents have been married for 42 years. I feel like social media just adds another layer. It though, does. Because it's like Girl. you've done... <laughs> You know, the first of all, people are nosy as hell. Second of all, you show them all the good. So then it's like, well, how much do I want to tell you about every time I see someone that has like a subliminal message about like leaving their husband? I'm like, damn, you know, it it takes it's another notch for, you know, the people who are can women, can women have it all yeah. and you can it just takes the right partner. It really does. And I felt like I was upset at myself for choosing the wrong partner. Like, mm. hey. They chose the right partner. Why you choose the wrong partner? And I was upset about that. But I also realized, like, you showed up for him. He had to show up for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Like, mm -hmm. you know, you gave him, like, and I'm not saying that he didn't because he showed up in a lot of ways. And he was, like, Kara's father was, he was a great, like, husband in a lot of regards. There's just things that fundamentally we disagree on Mm -hmm. and, like, ways he copes with things that I'm like, "Mm, I don't want to be part of that. that. Yeah. Um, But, yes, there was definitely, like, even seeing, like, there was a point where I'd be like, unfollow. I'm I don't want to say they happy asses. I'm <laughs> I'm but not that's, even going to hey, lie. That's good for your mental health. It that is. is it's like, you know what? Maybe we'll follow them back because they real cute. But, but I don't right, see right, this now, right now, no. Or it would be, um, you know, like certain things I wouldn't listen to or certain things I wouldn't watch everything because I felt like I'm not ready mm-hmm, to address mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that you mentioned people be watching because like, we and Karis' father um, separated in January. Um, he moved out Valentine's Day. And I didn't publicly Not announce, Day. and I was cool with it. Like, listen, I was like, if I can get through this week because it was Valentine's Day, our anniversary, and his birthday all in the same week, mm. and I was like, if I can get through this week, girl, you will be you okay. Can do anything. If you can get through this week where like all these major moments for you guys are coming, mm-hmm. you'll be okay. And um, I didn't publicly announce until June, though. Like, I I wanted to walk through my process. I wanted to walk through my grief. I wanted to walk through, like, my my transition, the transition for Karis. What Mm -hmm. does our new normal look like? Before I explain it to anybody that wasn't closely related to me. So when I announced it, it was funny because people was like, I felt a shift and I was wondering when you were going to say something or I noticed you weren't wearing your ring but I do want to say thank you all for being respectful Mm because nobody Mm -hmm. at any point reached out and was like girl you ain't wearing your ring what's Mm -hmm. up like nobody at any point Ask me that. I think, but I think people were like, something going on. She on a birthday trip. Yeah, she yeah, traveled yeah, for fourteen yeah. days, and that man ain't with people her. We reading between the lines. It, it it's real. cool. Read. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about I'm it when I want book, to talk baby. about it. Like I'll talk about it when I want to. All right, you ready to play a game? I love games. Kind of. I kind of. I kind of love okay, games. People don't be doing that good, but I, we're not gonna do trivia. <laughs> we're not gonna do trivia. Don't worry. I'm not. Well, gonna... I don't know. I might. Let's do one trivia question. You want to do one trivia question? One. Okay. I might do good. Okay. On so it. we're gonna. Okay. I'm gonna let you. Okay, um, okay. I'm gonna let you pick two. So we're gonna play inside of pull your card. You have these are pretty. Five, thank you. There's five different games. A mashup of my favorite party games from um, taboo to heads up to never ever have I ever. But we're not gonna get that spicy. Um, okay, That's so cute. pick your brand person did their thing. Thanks, girl. Pick one trivia card, <sighs> and then we're gonna play this or that. Okay. Let's see what we got. Okay. Oh, Last person didn't get this one right. Oh, Lord. But you might get it right. All right. <clears throat> Where is Bruno Mars's condo? Is this from a song or like know. in life? I don't know. You tell me. New York. All right. I'll give you a point. I'll give you a point. For that. <laughs> is okay. it Brooklyn? It's Manhattan. Oh, okay. I got a condo in Manhattan. Baby girl, what's happening? Oh, baby girl, what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Okay, she got it, She is good. Yeah, see? See? Okay. All right. You did that. Okay. So these are not as hard. It's literally just your opinion. Okay. Um, so this one is called this or that. I'm going to name two options. You just pick one. Okay. Insecure or power? Insecure. Without a doubt. You said that like, girl. girl I, I feel like my life at very like varying points is an episode is of insecure. insecure. Yeah. Yes, it, I had people move into my rental property like under it's like underneath the my nose. Closest insecure. thing to a real black woman's experience that I've ever seen. Shout out to Issa Rae. I can't wait to have you on the she show. She did her thing. She did her thing. Um okay, Fresh Prince or Martin? Ooh. Martin. I knew you were gonna say Martin. Nobody ever says Fresh Prince. Looks or money? Cause you got your own money, girl. I know. I got a lot of. I have to like to look at you. You can make money. 
Like, I don't, yeah. Looks. I'm going to say, okay. I'm going to say looks. Okay. Like, I know how to make money. Okay. We got that on lock. Okay. So this is a perfect question for Miss My Fat Finance herself. Um, would you choose an 800 credit score or 50K cash? 50K cash. Easy. Absolutely. 50K cash. Really? Why? Because I know how to make it work for me. Okay. I know that the 800 credit score will allow me to get to other things, but so will a 720. Like, there's not much difference in what you can get approved for between, like, 750 and 800. Really? But I know that 50K, I can do some things with that. So, aspiring to get a 750 is good enough. This 800 It thing depends is, on the person. Okay. For me, as a financial educator, like, I'm at 750, 760, work. I'm good. Like, I don't have... Well, and I mean, I, one of my fellow financial educators, you know, she has a perfect credit score. And she just, an article came out. And I was like, good for her. That seems so stressful. Because it's, like, one thing. And that thing ain't perfect no more. For me, it's, like... I really, when I'm looking at a goal, I look at how does this affect my life? Like, and for me, it's like 50K will affect my life more than having a perfect credit, credit score, score well, yeah. because there's certain okay. things I can do with that. Well, if, for the people who want more financial advice or just want to follow you and get a little bit more into your business, look right here in this camera and let the people know how they can stay connected with you, where they can find you online and all that good stuff. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. They did. Yes. So don't go to my website because we're doing some things over there. But you can find me at Tanya.Rapley on Instagram. As I mentioned, I'm in a personal transition. And so you get to witness this transition yes. outside of being a financial educator and a CEO and a mom. I'm also an art collector and investor. I'm sharing more about that journey and the spaces that I'm pivoting into. So if you're looking for inspiration, make sure that you follow Tanya.Rapley because I'm very honest and transparent on there. I answer a lot of questions that people have and we just have a good time on my platform. We do have a good time. And I hope y'all had a good time on this episode of Girl Stop Playing. Thank you so much for tuning in. Share this show with a friend. Love y'all and I'll see you next week. Girl, hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. This channel is all about encouraging you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so that you'll be notified when the next video drops. And comment below and let me know what you want to see on the next video. Peace out.